the ketogenic diet does more than just, you know, make your body burn fat. It actually changes your metabolic physiology. It changes your overall metabolism to ultimately change all those signaling pathways that are on posters and high end, you know, cancer research labs. It changes all of those signaling pathways to reduce the growth and proliferation and invasiveness and, and inflammation <laughs> associated with cancer, all the hallmarks of cancer. Welcome to the Wealthy Wealthy Wise podcast. If you would like to listen in on thought-provoking conversations with countercultural thought leaders and experts in the fields of wealth, health, and relationships, the three keys to having what I call a wealthy, wealthy life, then this is the show for you. I'm Christina Wise, real estate investor, best-selling author, falling for money, and founder of Wealthy Wealthy, where I serve as your personal guide to money, health, and happiness. Welcome back to Wealthy Wealthy Wise. This week, I talked to Dominique D'Agostino. Dominique is impressive. He's a PhD in neuroscience and physiology, and he's a tenured professor of molecular pharmacology and physiology. I came across Dominique's name. Actually, he was sourced often when I was looking at alternative treatments for my father's stage four terminal cancer. My father passed before I was able to talk to Dom, but nonetheless, Dom was incredible to get to know. He was so generous with his time, with his knowledge, and his passion for really researching. That's what he does. Is he's one of the lead researchers looking at alternative-based, metabolic-based therapies to help treat cancer and other neurological and overall diseases, I guess. So really, please listen. We go a little deep and he talks a lot of science, but I, I truly know you'll get so much value out of this conversation. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Dom, wow, it's such an honor to be here with you today. And it took us a while to get this on the calendar. And I've just been so looking forward to it for, for many months now. So I know you're a really, really busy man. So thank you for taking your time with me here today. Well, well thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Very and much. so you are, I mean, talk about brilliant, just you're a brilliant scientist, you're a professor, you're leading conversations really around the world in cancer research and and just the latest and so many potentially medical breakthroughs. So how does it feel to be you right now? Kind yeah. of on the edge of all this. Well, I don't think about it that way. I think, you know, I love, I feel very fortunate and grateful to be doing what I'm doing. I mean, as classically trained as really a, a basic scientist, research scientist uh, in neuroscience. And it was very rewarding and exciting for me to incorporate some of the stuff that I was really interested in as an undergrad, which was nutrition and nutrition science and supplementation into my neuroscience research program, which then branched off also to become cancer research too. So we do a variety of things working with the Department of Defense and the Navy and NASA and government organizations. So I feel you know very fortunate to be doing what I'm doing. And I think a lot of the success, I was thinking about it a lot yesterday, has come out from opportunities like you, you are providing me right now. So what I call outreach opportunities, if I put it into my faculty activity and I do something like this, you know, I label it under outreach because it really is. It's connecting with the, the layperson and even a lot of medical students and scientists listen to this information and it inspires their career path. So for me, I feel very fortunate to be doing what I'm doing, and I'm very excited to be on your show today. Thank you. Well, for thank you. Well, tell me about tell me about you a little bit, just background. What what brought you into the you know the the love of nutrition? You're obviously uh, very healthy and physiology, and I'm guessing exercise is very important to you as well. So give us give us the story of uh, of Dom. You growing up? Where'd you grow up? And what really brought us to where you are now? Yeah, I grew up in New Jersey, and uh, there's farms in New Jersey, actually. People just think of city, but uh, the more southern areas have farms. And uh, I grew up very active, outdoors, loved the outdoors, hunting, fishing, that sort of thing. And uh, I was inspired to start working out in nutrition because I played football in high school. And in my biology classes, I realized that, you know, the more I understood my body and how to fine tune it and make it perform better, I could perform better on the field. And that 
And that really inspired me. I kind of got my niche because I was a, a pretty bad student, I would say, through high school until I really got it was until it became like a, a selfish <laughs> pursuit to understand biology so I could leverage that to enhance, you know, my strength and performance and things like that. And that resulted in me choosing a neuroscience or a biology and nutrition science program at Rutgers University in New Jersey, which is a state university. And I studied biology and nutrition there. And I did undergrad research in neuroscience, uh, mostly to look good on my resume for medical school. <laughs> and as I started doing uh, science, you know, basic science as an undergraduate, that led to, I was inspired by my mentor at the time to actually pursue my PhD. So my undergraduate research became my doctoral, uh, I transitioned that into my uh, PhD research. Uh, I applied for the program and I got in and I went from my bachelor's degree into a PhD program, uh, which was five years of research. And I did my research at a clinical pulmonary critical care division. So I did it among medical doctors, go to grand rounds and their teaching. And it was kind of neat experience to do basic science research, but be among medical doctors and, you know, see patients and things like that too. And that in that clinical department, uh, I was separated from most of the other graduate students, but it was a great experience to be in the hospital doing that. And my research was on the neural control of autonomic regulation. So how our brains control how we feel and our physiology, our sympathetic nervous system, our parasympathetic system. In particular, I studied the neural control of respiration. So we have neurons in our brainstem that can sense the level of oxygen and CO2, and they modulate the respiratory output. And they're also implicated in the etiology of SIDS, like sudden infant death syndrome. So if uh, a failure to gasp, which is oxygen sensing neurons reacting to low oxygen in the brain and stimulating uh, uh, inspiration, a failure of that mechanism is implicated in the etiology of SIDS. So I was kind of studying that too. Uh, so it was respiration physiology, and I was scuba diving at the time and doing all my dive training courses for advanced uh, diving uh, certificate. And I, I saw a postdoctoral fellowship opportunity in that was mostly for military funding to look at the effects of high oxygen on the Navy SEAL warfighter. The limitation of their dive operations with a closed circuit rebreather is oxygen toxicity seizures. They get seizures if they dive too low. So my my fellowship, my postdoctoral fellowship, was studying the cellular and molecular mechanisms of that. And to do that, we created kind of unique technologies, hyperbaric chambers. And you think of a hyperbaric chamber, someone getting inside of it for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. It's got like twelve or thirteen different approved applications. We actually put microscopes inside hyperbaric chambers or electrophysiology equipment so we can look at the cell inside the hyperbaric chamber or look at the mitochondria inside the hyperbaric chamber under pressure that would simulate, for example, a Navy SEAL dive, or we can pull a vacuum to simulate space, you know, or those sorts of things. So I studied sort of the basic cell biology neuronal excitability, you know, how our brains respond to that. And, uh, and that research led to me being awarded various grants through the Department of Defense over many over 10 years or 12 years now. And those grants have allowed me to go up the ranks of academia from postdoctoral fellow to assistant professor to tenure track assistant professor to associate to uh, tenure and and that path. So that's where I'm at now. And uh, our lab now works very closely with special operations community, government organizations, foundations, private industry we work with. And I have PhD students, very enthusiastic undergraduate students, pre-medical students who are very excited to take nutrition and exercise uh, and to go into and incorporate that into their practice. And I also have students that are very interested in actually getting a very specialized skill, maybe in ketone supplementation and how that supplementation works in the various applications, and then going into industry. So, uh, so I've mentored students that have gone to uh, various medical schools and, and foundations and, and industry 
and, and also academia. So my last student is at the Moffitt Cancer Center where they are very interested in the ketogenic diet and ketone supplementation as an adjuvant to the standard of care of what they're doing. And they're even developing a whole metabolic treatment center. Uh, I recently gave a talk there and they're uh, surprisingly very interested now. Five years ago, they were not interested, but the National Cancer Institute is actually becoming more interested in funding clinical trials that use the ketogenic diet or other metabolic-based approaches that we use to further augment immune-based therapies uh, or even the standard of care chemo and radiation therapies uh, to improve, to reduce the side effects, to improve the sensitize the tumor cells so they're more responsive. Uh, some cancers are very responsive and some are not as responsive. So we need to kind of do the basic science research in animal models and in human uh, cells to understand what types of cancers are amenable to uh, really the diet and a whole toolbox of things that we have in the lab. Because there's, you know, we're studying various drugs, we're studying different types of ketogenic diets, different types of ketone supplements. We do hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, too in our protocols. And we know, for example, the efficacy of radiation therapy is directly proportional to the oxygenation in the tumor. So if a tumor has low oxygen, it will be, radiation will do very little against it. But if we reverse tumor hypoxia and hyperoxygenate the tumor prior to radiation, that sensitizes the tumor uh, to the damaging effects of radiation. So radiation strips electrons off oxygen. The oxygen has to be there to actually cause, to, to make the, the free radicals, what we call reactive oxygen species, to kill the cancer. So these are things that like physiologists or biochemists like me understand. And then we work with the oncologists, the radiation, radiotherapists to develop feasible uh, protocols that they use. And uh, so this is, we're working very actively with, and I never thought the research that we did for the special operations community <laughs> funded by the Department of Defense really led to, I mean, what we're doing now, 50% of what we do about is cancer research. So it's kind of neat how, and this happens all the time with the space program, the Apollo program led to many different discoveries that we are using every day, like that are in our cell phone, that are part of this technology we're talking with now. So the same thing happens with the research that we're doing. Military-based research really leads to many different discoveries that we can directly, you know, translate to the clinic. And that's really exciting for me. I bet. My goodness. And to really be, like you said, on the edge of maybe uh, changing some cancer standard of care and protocol or giving other options. And that's really where I stumbled across you and your work was my father was diagnosed with cancer back, I guess, last March or April, and he just passed in November. And when he was first diagnosed, I I, that's what I was looking to do is saying, okay, is there any latest research? What do we know? Are there alternatives to standard of care? Because I just didn't think based on his stage that, that chemo and radiation was you know, the, the right way to go, especially for his age. And so when I started really delving into the study of cancer and came across tripping over the truth and, and then was introduced to ketogenic diet and the metabolic theory of cancer. And your name was referenced in every, every, I mean, as a source from every, in every book or, or white paper I read for that matter. And it was just very interesting to not even knowing that this was an option, I guess. So what I'd love for everybody listening in is, can you share just a little bit? Because I know a lot of my listeners, you know, part of my goal with this is my dad has passed, but if we can help save somebody else, that then it makes this work really worthwhile. And so what is the metabolic theory of cancer and how is that different than maybe the genetic theory and where does, where does ketogenic diet and, and, you know, what your research is funding right now or discovering, what is, can you explain all that to a layman audience? Sure. I'll do the best at the way, you know, I do uh, quite a bit of outreach to, to lay population. So I'll frame it the way, you know, I kind of learned it because uh, I was trained as a neuroscientist and not so much a cancer biologist and cancer biology looked so incredibly complex to me. Like I would go into the cancer labs, these big, 
multi-million dollar government funded labs and see these posters on the on the board of all the signaling pathways and there would be thousands of, of signaling pathways and many of the drugs were targeting single pathways you know within the signal transduction cascade you know the ketogenic diet targets multiple pathways synergistically together there's a particular article that pretty much all scientists will reference when they're working on, you know, a review paper for science. It's called the hallmarks of cancer, right? And, uh, and a couple of the talks that I gave, one that I recently gave to the Moffitt Cancer Center was a very scientific breakdown of the hallmarks of cancer and how the ketogenic diet hits every hallmark of cancer, including, you know, things like angiogenesis, it seems like uh, things like metastasis, uh, dysregulated metabolism, invasiveness, inflammation. And I can reference, you know, very precisely uh, animal studies and human studies to show that the ketogenic diet nicely targets each of the hallmarks of cancer. And if you're dealing with, you know, something, if you have a glioblastoma, for example, an aggressive brain tumor, one of the go-to drugs is Avastin. And that targets uh, angiogenesis, just one one of the hallmarks of cancer, but not the other, not dysregulated metabolism. So, so that's very unique. You know, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but that's. Uh, so, I want the listeners to kind of know that the ketogenic diet does more than just you know make your body burn fat. It actually changes your metabolic physiology. It changes your overall metabolism to ultimately change all those signaling pathways that, you know, are on posters and high end, you know, cancer research labs, it changes all of those signaling pathways to reduce the growth and proliferation and invasiveness and, and inflammation <laughs> associated with cancer, all the hallmarks of cancer. So to take a further step back, so I got interested in the ketogenic diet uh, or the metabolic approach to cancer because some of the unique technologies that we developed in the lab, including the hyperbaric chambers uh, that we use to study military relevant questions, I started studying not only neurons in the brain, but I wanted to see, well, what will happen if I throw like fibroblast cells in there? What if I throw skin cells? And then a colleague had some cancer cells that were from a 44-year-old glioblastoma patient, uh, U87MG uh, cells, they're called. And I put those in there, and not knowing anything about cancer, I saw something different than I had seen in other cells. What I observed is that the rates of superoxide production, which is a free radical, dramatically went up when I hit the cells with high oxygen. And we can see this in the microscope inside the chamber. And no one had observed this before because no one had, no one had a microscope inside a chamber. <laughs> so I was seeing this for the first time. I guess I was the first person to see this for the first time, you know, at the level of the mitochondria. So we were looking at the mitochondrial free radical production in brain cancer cells in response to high pressure oxygen, a level of oxygen that you would experience with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So, but I was looking at cells in a Petri dish, but there are human cells. So I thought this was very interesting because I hadn't seen it in other cell cancer types uh, or other, other cell types. So this was the first cancer type. And I looked at other cancer types and saw the same thing. So I realized that it wasn't a unique uh, observation of a particular cancer cell type, but it also occurred in other types of cancer. So what I did is I reached out to people who were more knowledgeable than me on this. And they said, you know, probably what you're observing is the Warburg effect, this Warburg effect where we know or we have known for almost a century now is that cancer has a dysregulated metabolism. So it basically through mitochondrial dysregulation, some people call it mitochondrial damage, the cells default from using... Uh, to using high levels of glucose and glutamine to some extent, but mostly glucose. And they use this glucose for energy. Some cells, cancer cells, have rates 100 to 200 times higher glucose uptake than normal cells of the same tissue type. And, uh, and they, all, they use it for energy, and they use it to grow more tumor cells, to expand the, uh, the biomass of the, of the growing tumor. 
right? And there's different pathways, uh, you know, drug companies target, you know, to, to hit those pathways. So I became interested in if the metabolism is different, there must be chemotherapeutic drugs that target the metabolism. And I know that the, the technique, that the gold standard technique to basically identify the location and aggressiveness of tumors would be the, the glucose PET scan or the fluorodeoxyglucose PET scan. So it's a radio labeled glucose molecule that when you consume it and get it in your body and you image the tumor, the tumor lights up like a Christmas tree and that's indicative of it consuming energy and essentially starving the tissue around it. So it has rates of glucose consumption that are off the charts relative to the healthy tissue. So oncologists use this information to identify the location and in particular, the aggressiveness of the cancer, but they don't use that information to target the cancer, which I found amazing, which I found like to be uh, very disturbing in some ways. Having, you know, uh, cancer has affected my family, my wife's family, and many, many others that I know. Uh, that it seemed very simple. The simplest approach is to limit the availability of that glucose to the tumor. And a ketogenic diet, which I was studying for oxygen toxicity seizures and epilepsy, the ketogenic diet seemed like the logical approach. You reduce the level of glucose uh, availability and the spikes in glucose that typically occur after a carbohydrate meal are abolished. And those spikes are really the things that drive we think drive cancer growth because insulin spikes up too when you eat carbohydrates and then it comes back down. Uh, but baseline levels of glucose go down and the spikes go down with a ketogenic diet, especially if it's calorie restricted a little bit. And then the ketone levels come up and we know largely, generally speaking, most cancer cells cannot use ketones as an energy source. So they lack certain enzymes, ketolytic enzymes, you know, succinyl-CoA transferase for the scientist guide people out there is typically deficient in most cancer cells. Uh, some we know may have this enzyme, but not as high levels as the healthy cells do. So it became obvious to me that cancer was definitely a metabolic disease in that we can use metabolic approaches to effectively target the growth and proliferation of cancer. The big question that remains is, is the origin of cancer metabolic or genetic? So I'm, I'm kind of uh, in the camp, I would say, as that cancer is a metabolic disease with the understanding that the mitochondria are the ultimate tumor suppressor, a healthy mitochondria. So if our mitochondria are healthy, we create lots of energy in our cells in the form of ATP. So ATP is the energy that our cells use, and it comes primarily from the mitochondria. If ATP levels are deficient or low in any way from damaged cell metabolism, if the ATP levels fall, the nucleus of the cell contains the DNA. And there's very robust DNA repair mechanisms in the nucleus. And the nucleus can sense, there's crosstalk between the nucleus of the cell and the little energy producers called the mitochondria. And if the mitochondria are e very easily damaged by things like inflammation, radiation, different drugs in the environment, our immune system, and even viruses that cause cancer, they actually attack the mitochondria. And if the mitochondria can't make enough ATP, the nucleus can sense that and it it, it does a number of things. It reduces the DNA repair mechanisms so we can get more, more damage to our DNA, especially from environmental factors if we're under stress, if our immune system is hit. And, and so if the ATP levels fall, the, the nucleus can essentially, it's like a brain. It can sense that. And what it does is kick on oncogenes. So oncogenes are the genes that when they are activated, they actually transform a normal cell into a cancer cell. So many of the oncogenes are, are things that dramatically enhance the, the sugar burning processes in the body. We call the glycolytic metabolism or substrate level metabolism for the science folks out there. So 
we're under stress, inflammation, immune system gets hit, radiation, chemicals in the environment, just unhealthy lifestyle. And that damages the very sensitive mitochondria. ATP levels fall. The nucleus of the brain of the cell can sense that. And you get increase in DNA, a decrease in DNA repair, which you have more damaged DNA over time, double-stranded hits, you know, uh, nicks if, if, you know, there's heavy toxins or radiation. And then that, the cell senses an energetic crisis. And when a cell senses an energetic crisis to avert dying, many cells will die off. But the ones that can activate the complement of oncogenes, those cells will go on and live. So you have, you know, a thousand cells and 990 die off and 10 of them activate these oncogenes that allow the cell to survive that stress, that energetic crisis. And those cells go on to, it kicks on a genetic program that allows it to divide and expand. And that's the precancerous cell. And then with further damage to the cell, and if the immune system does not recognize it, and kill the cell through autophagy or other processes, that cell mass will continue to expand and it could expand and then branch off, get into the bloodstream and go to other organs of the body, like the liver which is, or the lungs, which is kind of a, a fertile ground for these cells to grow. And they, lock, you know, they stick onto the blood cells or a little niche in, in the uh, tissue environment and they start to expand there and grow. And that's metastasis, that's invasiveness. And we know all those processes that I just described to you are reduced. Those carcinogenic processes we call carcinogenesis are significantly reduced if our metabolic physiology is put into a state of therapeutic fasting or the ketogenic diet. Of course, that's kind of like my little niche of research, but lifestyle factors like exercise, moderating stress levels through meditation, yoga, you know, healthy relationships, pets, you know, just getting outdoors, nature, those kinds of things are undoubtedly a factor, sunlight, of course. But we know that nutrition is like a big hammer. It's a big, if you, and it's, it's as simple as not even changing the calories, but the, what we call the macronutrient profile of your diet. So you have X amount of carbohydrates, X amount of fat, X amount of protein. And if we change those ratios to what I follow, like a modified ketogenic diet, which is 60 to like 65% fat, maybe 20% protein, and the rest of fibrous carbohydrates from vegetables, primarily green vegetables, salads, you know, asparagus, things like that, testing ketogenic foods too. If we just go from a normal standard diet to a ketogenic diet, that changes our entire physiology to reduce inflammation in the body, to reduce the levels of insulin, to reduce the spikes in glucose. And all these things we think long-term, if they are followed uh, either continuously or intermittently, you go into a state of ketosis a couple times a year, that can help, uh, or maybe you do periodic fasting, like intermittent fasting, that may allow the body to purge precancerous cells that are developing in the body through a process called autophagy, you know, and calorie restriction can do the same thing to some extent, but it seems to, it seems to be more robust uh, in a state of nutritional ketosis or with protocols that people are calling intermittent fasting or time restricted eating. So that's also something that we're working on studying uh, the effects of time restricted eating. Oh my goodness, you said so much and all of that. So thank you. I mean, talk about a wealth of information. So dissecting a few of the things that you just talked about. One, if I understood correctly, part of maybe the theory or hypothesis is that, okay, is it, it does cancer start? Is it genetics or is it metabolism and lifestyle that I guess lifestyle that affects the metabolism positively or negatively? And what you're saying, or if I listen correctly, it's saying, okay, there's likely a genetic component, but those, those cells might not be turned on if we have a healthy lifestyle. So it's through our unhealthy lifestyle and the, you know, that damages the mitochondria, they get sick, lowers ATP to production. And then over time, those cells can change even though, you know, but if there's, even though there's that same genetic component available, 
the same healthy lifestyle, you know, the you know, two different people with that same gene, let's say if that were possible, one might develop cancer and one might not just because of the difference in, in mitochondrial health. Yeah. And, and genetic. So there's a genetic predisposition too. So the activation of oncogenes is... And what is an oncogene? Okay, and uh, we have genes in our body that make, uh, that are, many of them, the ones that are continuously active are making proteins, like skin proteins, eye proteins that are uh, of a specific tissue origin and cell type, right? So uh, an oncogene is a gene that constitutively it stays inactive, but under certain conditions, under if various molecular events, like an energetic crisis, will can activate an oncogene, and that oncogene can, for example, many of the ones associated with cancer, increase the production of metabolism that that's glucose metabolism. We call it glycolytic metabolism. And uh, many of them increase the ability of the cell to evade the immune system, the ability of the cancer cell to increase unbridled proliferation is really the hallmark of many of these, these oncogenes. And unbridled proliferation necessitates a huge increase in glucose metabolism. So, so I view it, you know, I view it in the context of what can restrict that unbridled proliferation of cells. So, you know, looking at the cell is what is this, what is the cell, what is that tumor using for fuel? And it's using primarily glucose and some amino acids, alanine, glutamine. These are kind of things we're studying in the lab, but glucose is really the big carbon source. So if we like get into the tumor and analyze the tumor and we figure out, we can do various tracer studies are called and figure out like, how did all this mass of a tumor eat, like get here? Like mm-hmm. what, what fuel led to that? And we can radio light label glucose and then analyze, for example, the membrane or various parts of the cell uh, or, you know, CO2 production, which is like if the, if the tumor is using glucose for fuel, we can pick that up. And that, that basically shows that like 80%, 90%, some cancers can use fatty acids and, and glutamine and amino acids. But for the large extent, most of that cell mass and energy production is coming from glucose. So, uh, so the kind of the no brainer thing to do, right, is to kind of change your diet. And what that does, that sets the stage for other therapies to work. So we study the ketogenic diet, but we never study it as a standalone therapy. We study the, we study nutritional ketosis as different forms of the ketogenic diet and ketone supplementation as a way to set the stage uh, we call that a press. <laughs> so it basically takes, it puts metabolic stress on the tumor because now it can't, now it's starved for energy. Now you're starving, you're causing energetic crisis of the tumor itself. And uh, it makes the tumor, it knocks down the tumor defenses. So it's not as robust. So we can come in with various agents to kill it. <laughs> and that could be chemo, it could be radiation, it could be immune-based therapies, we are really focused on developing non-toxic therapies that could be a drug, like something as simple as metformin, you know, which use, we think that that could be used and we have a whole toolbox of drugs, but the idea is press and then pulse. So the press would be like a calorie restricted ketogenic diet with intermittent fasting and maybe a low dose of metformin on top of that. And that will at least as the tumor is growing this fast, it'll slow it down to this or maybe even decrease it a little bit. And then we come in with pulse protocols, which could be an aggressive, you know, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, 2.5 atmospheres, you know, 60 to 90 minutes. And that's hyper oxygenating the tumor. In addition, you know, we are looking at various drug protocols, metabolic based drug protocols that can be taken just prior to hyperbaric oxygen therapy that would cripple the tumor's defenses while you're hitting it with high pressure oxygen. So radiation kills tumors by stimulating free radical production inside the tumor. Hyperbaric oxygen does the same thing, but it does it in a completely non-toxic way. Obviously it's not as powerful. It's not as potent and it's, it doesn't seem to work well as a standalone, 
But if you do nutritional ketosis and you do a press therapy, hyperbaric oxygen has an anti-cancer effect. If you weaken the tumor with various metabolic-based approaches or you combine it with other, other things. So these are sort of uh, strategies that we are testing now in animal models of brain tumors, metastatic cancer, breast cancer. Uh, we're going to look at lung and pancreatic cancer. And so we want to identify what types of cancers would be amenable uh, or most responsive to these metabolic-based therapies. And how do we have, you know, how do we titrate and design and engineer the therapy to work best for that, for that tumor type? First in the in the animal models, but we're working closely with the Moffitt Cancer Center and move it to clinical trials too. And, and that's really exciting. For example, when my father was going through his treatment and the traditional conventional approach, he, I mean, you know, I was asking even the oncologist about nutrition and the ketogenic diet, and they just would have nothing of it. And, and really the response was, is your father just needs to eat. He needs calories. So if you need to feed him boxed mashed potatoes, instant mashed potatoes, if that's all he will eat, just feed him anything, feed him sugar. They're giving him lollipops and the uh, product they use. Yeah. So, products, which is like sugar milk. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, it, you know, it was, it was very confusing to my father because he wanted to listen to the doctors, of course, and they were conflicting messages. So I'm just so happy that hopefully your work will continue to spread and you're actually working with some of these cancer theory theories, I mean, centers, so that maybe some, you know, oncologists will be more open-minded and have more tools available. But for those listening that aren't really familiar or as familiar with the ketogenic diet, would you describe that a little bit? I mean, it's becoming more popular, obviously, now, as opposed to just a year or two years ago, where I would say the, the more mainstream audience have probably never heard of it. But I still am guessing there's a lot of listeners that don't quite know what it is and how that's different uh, than, than more of the... How do you say it? The Atkins diet or, there you like, go. Uh, or low carb or paleo diet. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the keto diet, I think it was the most like Google diet of 2017, I believe. <laughs> so that was uh, a couple news reporters reached out to me and they wanted, you know, a story. Why is the keto diet, you know, the most uh, Googled? I think guys like Mark Sisson, you know, being on Good Morning America you know, with his book and, and other influencers out there really doing a great job getting the message across. Uh, it's important to recognize, though, that the ketogenic diet is a metabolic therapy specifically, it evolved specifically for pediatric epilepsy in the 1920s in the Mayo Clinic. And they observed through millennia in biblical times, even prior to that, you know, Hippocrates, like 400 BC, that fasting was a means to control seizures. When you had, you know, they didn't have drugs back then. So if you fast, you know, it just worked. They knew this through millennia. Uh, and it wasn't until like, you know, 1920, where it was observed that if someone just ate fat, if you were just eating butter or lard all day, you can get all the calories you need. And your body starts making, in the, in the blood and in the urine, these things show up that are kind of weird. They didn't know what they were. And uh, they, they looked at them biochemically and they were ketones. So acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate, which is pr produced through acetoacetate. And these were ketone molecules. So they called it uh, eating, eating fat, pure fat was the ketogenic diet. And it was similar metabolically, your metabolic physiology was very similar on a ketogenic diet as it was with fasting meaning that insulin was super low. So carbohydrates and proteins can increase insulin, mostly carbohydrates spike up insulin, but fat really doesn't have an effect on it. So m through metabolic physiology, it's like, well, your glucose is real low and insulin is real low and we have these ketones and you can eat the same the um, amount of calories that you can maintain your weight and sustain your body. So since this mimicked fasting, they use that as a means to control seizures. And it was remarkably effective right out of the gate. So it worked like remarkably effective. And then as science advanced in the 1960s and early 70s, various, this was the standard of care for epilepsy, actually. <laughs> and in 1960, 50s, 60s, 70s, different drugs came on board that had side effects, but 
uh, it was much easier for doctors to prescribe than this, this really draconian <laughs> high fat diet. So they started using more drugs, but the, what happened is you need more and more drugs to control the seizures and then combinations of drugs. And then they had really bad side effects. And if you're a child and you take these drugs, it prevents you from reaching your IQ level. It prevent it has developmental effects that go on to your adulthood. So you never reach your potential, you know, uh, and it does that through altering the neural circuitry that are part of the de developmental biology. So I think it became extremely important for the pediatric population to use. So they did maintain use of the ketogenic diet through that time. Uh, and there were a number of influential people. The ketogenic diet was more or less kind of put on the shelf only for extreme situations. And then uh, there was an influential person, uh, Jim Abrams. Uh, he was a Hollywood producer. He made the airplane movie. And his son, Charlie, was stricken with epilepsy, and he used multiple anti-epileptic drugs in combination and had horrible side effects. It's a horrible kind of story what he went through. Long story short, but if you want the story, Meryl Streep did a movie about the story. It's called First Do No Harm. And Meryl Streep did a movie about the ketogenic diet. Like most people don't know that. <laughs> she did a ketogenic diet movie, and it's called First Do No Harm. And it's about the story of really documents uh, the true story of Charlie Abrams, Jim Abrams. Uh, he was a Hollywood producer. He knew Meryl Streep and she made uh, an incredible movie that kind of documents the uh, potential of the ketogenic diet and really highlights the fact that it's grossly underutilized approach for epilepsy and now other neurological diseases. So the movie was made, you know, in the mid, mid to late 1990s. And then Jim was on a show called Dateline NBC. Uh, I don't know if that show is still going or whatever. And that got attention for it. And, uh, and now the Charlie Foundation was created. And I've given talks on behalf of the Charlie Foundation. I gave a TEDx talk in uh, 2013 and highlighted, you know, the Charlie Foundation because they, that was my introduction to the ketogenic diet. I started searching and I was like, you know, the military is funding me to prevent seizures. And then I found out, wow, nutrition can promote seizures. And the ketogenic diet is not this fad diet for like Atkins. It's different than Atkins because it's lower in protein. The clinical ketogenic diet is lower in protein. Uh, so I became really excited. I was like, wow, this is an opportunity to do nutritional neuroscience. So I can bring nutrition back into the lab, into my into my office, really. And, uh, and I, you know, I contacted Jim, Jim Abrams and, and uh, the dietitian, Beth Zupatkania is the lead dietitian for the Charlie Foundation. And they give out so many information. So if your listeners just want information about the ketogenic diet for medical or even everyday use, there's recipes on there, you know, ketogenic brownies, cupcakes, like even go-to foods. Uh, and how to design your meal plan. The Keto Calculator is an app you can download and just, you have to plug in, you know, it helps you calculate the macronutrient profile so you can design your meals if you choose to follow the ketogenic diet the correct way. And then you can measure your ketones and urine ketones. Uh, it would be easy, cheap way. And once you kind of do that, I think it's good to measure blood ketones too. And uh, I personally follow the ketogenic diet, not the medical ketogenic diet, but a modified form of it. Dr. Eric Kossoff at Johns Hopkins University is really the pioneer in the modified ketogenic diet, which is used in adult epilepsy patients. And when I discovered Dr. Eric Kossoff's work at Johns Hopkins, I was like, wow, uh, I started with the ketogenic diet with a medical ketogenic diet, and it was about 87% fat, almost 90% fat. And it was difficult for me to follow. And I wanted to follow it just because I was doing research in that area. But the modified ketogenic diet is something that's relatively easy for most people to follow. And there's a lot of health benefits to it. And uh, probably not good to stay on it all the time, but to periodically go in and out of ketosis, I think would work with our natural physiology. I think it's, I'll state it this way. I think it's unnatural to never go in a state of either fasting ketosis or nutritional ketosis. That is very unnatural for the body to get boluses of carbohydrates three or four or five times a day, which I was doing, <laughs> you know, 10 years or more ago, uh, and to never actually have your body produce ketones. 
because when you get into a state of ketosis, that activates a genetic program that can stimulate things like autophagy, which is killing precancer cells in the body. It stimulates genes in our body that we know are linked to longevity. You know, and these are some of the things that we kind of study in the lab at the molecular level, at the level of the, you know, the DNA or the RNA, and even the various uh, signaling molecules that are in our blood, we can study some of these things. So I would say for your audience out there, the ketogenic diet is not a fad diet. It's a medical diet that has a hundred years track record behind it, but the track record is for controlling seizures. And I got into this 10 years ago and it was only pediatric epilepsy, but now it has exploded (laughs) because researchers at Ivy League institutions, like we collaborate with Yale University, I mean, they're looking at inflammation, they're looking at gout, they're looking at acne, they're looking at polycystic ovary syndrome, which, you know, there's scientific publications showing that ALS, uh, MS, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. Uh, of course, cancer, which we do a lot of research here on cancer, uh, autoimmune disorders. So it tends, when you're in a state of nutritional ketosis, it suppresses an inflammatory complex called the NLRP inflammasome. It's not important to recognize that, but it's a complex that the being in ketosis keeps that suppressed. If you have an autoimmune disorder, that complex is activated uh, tremendously, and that contributes to systemic inflammation in the body. It also contributes to age-related chronic diseases. And for reasons we're studying now, and our colleagues at uh, Yale are studying this, the the ketone beta-hydroxybutyrate keeps that that inflammatory complex suppressed and at bay. And that can be beneficial if our body is under stress and we jump into a state of ketosis, it can help limit that inflammation. And people have emailed me with things like uh, they have autoimmune disorders, they have viral illnesses like shingles or like herpes simplex or shingles, and they feel it coming on and then they fast, they put their body into a state of ketosis and then they never get the symptoms. They may get the start of a cold sore, then it never manifests, or they might get a little bit of shingles and then it it never kind of manifests. And the same things for a number of different autoimmune disorders that people have, like people contacting me with like Hashimoto's you know, all these different immune, I wasn't even aware of half of them that people are emailing me, but they're like, I want to make you aware of this, that I had this disorders. I came across your information. I thought it may work for me. So at the first sign of this, you know, terrible inflammation disorder that I have, this disease that I have, I, I start doing a therapeutic fast. And then, you know, I do it for two or three days and then, you know, I never have the symptoms again. So this is the way I'm controlling it. So now I have control over my life because I can do the diet or therapeutic fasting. So it, it has creeped into areas of medicine and science that I never would have thought, you know, one of my PhD students actually did her PhD dissertation on the wound healing properties of nutritional ketosis. So typically to heal a wound, we put stuff on the wound. But if you, we change our metabolic physiology, we can reduce the inflammation and help perfuse that wound tissue to get oxygen and nutrition to heal up faster. And, you know, and we work with people in the wound healing kind of society that are at the top level, and they are remarkably <laughs> impressed with the ability of nutritional ketosis, even ketone supplementation to enhance, uh, to further augment the wound healing process not only in the aged individual with like type 2 diabetes, but in healthy individuals. So it's really hard for a healthy, robust, you know, uh, Navy SEAL warfighter, for example, to further enhance his wound healing ability. But uh, the animal data that we have suggests that that happens. And we haven't been able to replicate that with like drugs or other devices or things that we actually put on the wound. Change the metabolic physiology to enhance so many processes in the body. Bottom line, nutrition matters and that, <laughs> and it's still being overlooked. And it, it, it's what I hear you saying. It especially matters when we're affected with some sort of disease state and yeah. cancer specifically that we've been talking about based on your research and that, but then lifestyle also, if we want to avoid hopefully or stave off some, you know, de- you know especially age-related disease as long as possible that might catch up with this eventually. But, but 
Bottom line lifestyle. So when we're talking about and we're really approaching the end of our time together here and I could talk to you forever. My goodness, you're just like I said, such a wealth of knowledge. But to go back with lifestyle and and so there's the disease state and you've just been so helpful. I think anybody listening that's been affected by cancer, you've given them so much new maybe ways to new knowledge and things to think about or research that they can look into. When it comes to being healthy and creating, like you said, healthy mitochondria, what does that look like? What is your definition of a healthy lifestyle for these, you know, happy, healthy little mitochondria in ourselves that are creating, you know, allow us to have the energy and vitality that we want to live a good life? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think it, it may vary between individuals, but I'm going to give you kind of my suggestion, which would be when you transition your metabolic physiology from burning sugars and carbohydrates to burning preferentially more fat and ketones, which are a byproduct of fat metabolism, a byproduct, but the ketone in and of itself is a very powerful alternative fuel that can help stimulate your brain activity and stimulate your body tissues. When you transition your body away from a sugar carbohydrate-based metabolism to more fatty acid and ketone metabolism, that stimulates mitochondrial biogenesis and mitochondrial health. So the mitochondria, remember, are the powerhouses. So you are really, in a way, stressing the cells to rely less on glycolysis, which is independent of the mitochondria. And when you take sugar away, the mitochondria have to work harder to metabolize fat and ketones for energy. And it's called a hormetic effect. Like a hormetic effect is like, it's like a stress that results in adaptations that make you more resilient and more robust in the face of that stress again. So it boosts our resilience and in our environment, you know, we need to be resilient. So it really stimulates the mitochondrial energy production in the cells to, to work harder and to be enhanced. And I think the things like, what are the practical things that people can look at? I think a simple blood glucose monitoring system is an incredibly cheap and powerful tool <laughs> to, for a person to have, like we have them all around the lab. So simply measure your baseline, your fasting glucose levels and your glucose response to a meal. And you'll find if you eat a sugary carbohydrate meal, you'll have a huge spike in glucose that'll come down and insulin spikes up too. If you eat a low carb paleo meal, you'll just get a relatively little blip in the, in your spike in insulin, uh, glucose and insulin. And if you eat a purely ketogenic meal, uh, you'll have a very little spike. I mean, so, you know, standard diet, you know, low carb paleo diet, and then a little blip for the keto diet. So that glucose response, uh, elevation in glucose in response to a meal is a really useful biomarker to measure and your baseline glucose too, uh, a very useful biomarker to measure. And then I would encourage people just to get normal blood work. So your triglyceride levels, your glucose levels, uh, your C reactive protein. So Ideally, you want high sensitivity HSCRP, C-reactive protein, and uh, yeah, triglycerides, glucose levels, C-reactive protein. They're like the big ones. I could name like a dozen or more, but they're like the big ones. And of course, your heart rate and your blood pressure. So uh, I wear at nighttime, typically at every night I wear the Aura Ring, which measures my sleep and also my heart rate during the day. So uh, the ketogenic diet really works very effectively to bring down your blood pressure, probably because it helps to lower, to some extent, your sympathetic stress response <laughs> and sympatho excitatory response, we call uh, in neuroscience. And it also helps our body excrete excess sodium. So insulin, insulin gets our body to absorb and hold on to sodium, which makes us puffy and makes us hold water. When we go on a ketogenic diet, since insulin drops, it allows our body to release excess sodium. And, uh, and by, by eliminating excess water in our body, that actually brings down our blood pressure a little bit. And uh, sometimes it's a little bit too effective. If someone's on blood pressure medication, they should get off. 
if they start the diet and they stand up out of their chair and they have what's called orthostatic hypotension, they feel a little bit dizzy, they need to drink more fluids and probably add a little more salt to their food, but probably drink more fluids. So these are some of the things I think they need to consider. Anything else? <laughs> I guess the, the only final thing to that is, uh, is exercise. Like how yeah. do you, what part does that fit in? Is it? Yeah, that's a priority. Uh, so I like to budget my time to no matter how busy, uh, we are, you know, as a family, we budget in creative downtime. Uh, and for us, we have two dogs, two rescue dogs. One's a, a big one, uh, great Dane, the other a black lab. And we go out, you know, pretty much every single night and we take the dogs out. So I think it's like pet therapy, right? You run around with the dogs and just playtime. I always call it playtime. And that does, uh, if I'm wearing a device and I'm measuring, you know, my stress levels through heart rate variability or things like that, it has a tremendous effect on my overall health, my psychological health and my physiological. I can actually see it and like collect the data to show that playtime or creative downtime is extremely important. Uh, just going to the gym too is a tremendous outlet that I use all throughout my academic career. And even as a PhD student, I would probably succumb to things like substance abuse, you know, if I didn't have the gym outlet. Uh, but that stuff, you know, never tempted me because the gym really was kind of my therapy, uh, exercise and therapy. And I would encourage people, and maybe if they even have a substance abuse problem too, uh, the gym. I mean, you you have endorphins, you have all these factors that are released when you work out and, and it's a good addiction to have. <laughs> so healthy relationships, mm -hmm. gym time, exercise, fresh air, sunshine, all these things are equally or more important than nutrition. I think, well, nutrition might be the hub. I, I'm, I'm biased. So I'll say nutrition <laughs> is extreme. The food that we put in our body obviously is going to play a big role in our overall health and longevity and uh, disease management and disease prevention, too. Well, I love it. Well, thank you. I have one more question that I ask all my guests. And, and you are obviously a leader in your field, leader in everything that you're doing. And like I said earlier, just a, a sought-after sought resource and source of knowledge in so many different categories. I'm guessing you stumble across a lot of conventional wisdom out there that is just flat out wrong. Is there any myth that you'd like to bust that, that you just stumble across constantly that, that you think is keeping people, you know, their lack of awareness or, or belief, I guess, in that conventional wisdom that you believe is wrong is, is hurting people or harming them or keeping them from reaching their potential? Yeah, there's quite a few, like in our field in science. Uh, so if I had to pick one relevant to the discussion today is that, um, you know, I, I am in favor of, th there's a lot of talk out there, especially from the vegan community, that a plant-based diet devoid of all animal protein is by far the most healthy diet to follow devoid of all animal protein and uh, and that plant or that things like eggs and meat uh, are very carcinogenic. I mean, there's a number of books that are written. The last one I read, it's called How Not to Die by Michael, Michael Greer. Uh, it was a very cleverly written book. Uh, and I think it was a promotion of, of a more plant-based eating regimen. Interestingly, the ketogenic diet, I, I eat way more plants on the ketogenic diet and it's actually much lower in protein than the standard American diet. The, the uh, clinical ketogenic diet got criticized because the protein level was so low. Uh, it was like uh, eight to 12% and then kids, you know, stunted their growth. So this idea that a vegan diet or a plant-based diet is really the most effective uh, approach to disease prevention and also for cancer patients. Because a lot of cancer patients contact me and they will send me articles on meat, you know, meat causes colon cancer, causes this and that, but they're not, you know, they don't delve into what the meat was eaten with, or they do a high fat diet, but it's not in the context of carbohydrate restriction, ketogenic diet. So I get more emails. I'm just bringing that up because just on, based on email volume, that's a big misconception, but that has motivated me for, 
you know, uh, ethical reasons, cultural reasons, and because people just want to do a, a vegan based diet, you know, I mean, it's not for me per se, but uh, I want to try it out myself because we are actually working on formulating a meal plans. So someone who is interested in following a ketogenic diet for cultural re- reasons or, or whatnot, they, that will be an available, to, that will be available to them. A vegetarian, which is easy because you can use eggs and dairy and whatever, but a vegan based diet is going to take some, a scientist will need to work with a chef mm. <laughs> to actually create, you know, the meal plans that adhere to the macronutrient profile and types of fats and proteins and amino acids that would actually allow that person to eat a vegan ketogenic diet and stay in nutritional ketosis. So, so maybe it's a criticism that, you know, the vegan community, uh, meat based diets are really heavily criticized. And I think that, uh, uh, we, and, and high fat diets too are heavily criticized, but it's the, the research that they point to are not in the context of the ketogenic diet where there are very specific macronutrient ratios. So for those out there who believe that high fat diets are dangerous, that high protein diets are dangerous, and that the ketogenic diet is a high protein, high fat diet, they're wrong. (laughs) But I'm also sympathetic to the vegan community. And I think it would be really great to formulate a vegan ketogenic diet meal plan that's efficacious in producing nutritional ketosis and also palatable or maybe even hyper palatable. And there's some food companies out there that I'd like to work with, you know, to, to develop this because I'd like to test drive it myself, actually. So maybe that's I see that a lot on social media, you know, people on different diet camps criticizing one another. Mm-hmm. I never, been, But I see it pass in my feed. So I thought it might be a, a good point misconception to kind of highlight because also I teach the medical students and also uh, medical doctors here. And they have those questions too. Well, a high fat diet will cause cancer. A high fat diet will, you know, lead you to gain more fat. But, and they think ketogenic diet is a high fat diet, but not in the, con- you have to think about it in the context of carbohydrate restriction. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of when the magic happens. Well, I love it. And I love how open-minded you are as well. I mean, you're clearly a researcher and experimenter and, and you test things on yourself. And again, I just love your attitude, your mood and, and your willingness to share and be present and especially in light of everything you have going on. So my goodness, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate this platform to get the information across. And if your listeners want more information on what we do, ketonutrition.org is there. And there's various products that I've vetted out, uh, information, there's clinical trials listed there. There's doctors, there's consultants. If they want a consultant to help them get into the ketogenic diet to work with a couple days, uh, you'll find them there. So keto nutrition, all one word, dot O-R-G has sort of uh, hits on a lot of topics that we talked about today. Um, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you. Thanks for having me. And so ends another episode of the Wealthy Wealthy Life podcast where Christina brings you unconventional, cutting-edge strategies from leading experts to optimize your wealth and your health. As a token of gratitude for listening, go to podcast.fallingformoney.com and download a free copy of her best-selling book, Falling for Money. If you're ready to change your relationship with money, head on over to podcast.fallingformoney.com and download your free copy today.